to our first EAP seminar, English for Academic Purposes, where we get into some specifics. Uh, and in order to do this, especially today, I'm going to be teaching you a little bit of linguistics, which will be fun, particularly uh, phonology, um, the study of um, phonemes. So we're talking about English speaking skills. And um, focusing particularly on pronunciation, but also some tips for delivery later on. Uh, one big problem is the, the sound system, the sounds of Korean and English are, are so very, very different. So in linguistics, when we talk about the sound system, we call this phonology. You don't need to know this, but this is a, the area of linguistics that deals with sounds and the sound system of languages. And uh, the, the way sounds are organized in English, the phonology of English is so very, very different from the way sounds are organized in Korean, uh, the Korean phonology. And we're talking about, we can talk about phonemes, which are, you know, the distinctive sounds of the language, like the B and the P and the G and the K and the A ah and the A and such. And those are phonemes. And we'll talk about important vowel phonemes of English that are problematic for Koreans. We'll talk about consonant phonemes, consonant sounds that are problematic for Koreans, and there are a lot. Uh, but even more important than the vowels and the consonants are um, things like rhythm and stress patterns, because if you, even if you say the vowels and the consonants correctly, if your stress and rhythm are off, you can still be misunderstood. So we'll talk a, uh, a good deal also about stress, rhythm, intonation and such, and then finally some general tips for delivery, uh, <coughs> speaking delivery. So first, the, the vowel phonemes. Um, Korean has a very simple vowel system. English has a really complex vowel system. Uh, and of course, a big problem also is not only are the two languages very different, but in your English education here in Korea, probably pronunciation was not really taught, or it wasn't taught very well. And also some of the reference books like dictionaries here also sometimes use symbols that are kind of confusing and misleading. Um, dictionaries from America also use a very different set of symbols for these uh, phonemes which are confusing. <coughs> so uh, a common problem is, for example, uh, the sound of bit versus beat. And your dictionaries might use this symbol, but that's really misleading. Okay. So let me make some room here for beat. Your dictionaries probably use this symbol, which is which is okay. That's actually accurate for the sound of beat. Uh, but if your dictionaries use this symbol for the short vowel, that's kind of wrong or it's misleading because it makes you think that the two vowels are similar except in length, and that's not really true. And you might be saying beat and beat, and that's not really an accurate pronunciation of this thing. Because uh, in Korean you have just E, and it tends to be kind of in between. It's kind of medium length in Korean generally. Whereas in English we have a distinction between the long and the short. But it's not just long and short, but there's something else. So first let me give you, this is actually the correct symbol, it's a small capital I, because the vowel is not just shorter, but it's, it's a really a different sound. For E, your tongue muscle, your, your tongue is basically a muscle. Uh, your, your tongue is just one big muscle. And muscles, like your tongue muscle or your arm muscles, uh, can contract, um, they stiffen, or they can relax. Um, so you can tense your muscles. You can, I'm wearing shirts so you can't see my beautiful muscles, but you can, uh, but with your tongue, you can, when you say E, you, you can feel that your tongue is tensing up. And because it's tense here, your tongue is particularly high. The tip of your tongue is really high up in the mouth and is really front in the mouth. But if you hear this one, it's not just, it's relaxed. The tongue muscle is relaxed, and that produces a different vowel sound altogether. It's not just shorter, but it's relaxed. Your tongue muscle is relaxed. Pretend you're at the dentist and you just got the pain shot, the painkiller, and your mouth is you know, you know, like that at the dentist. Uh, pretend your tongue is kind of numb. It's short, but it's also relaxed. Your tongue is relaxed. 
And that, be, that means your tongue is not as high in the mouth, it's not as front, because uh, for this, your, your tongue is really high and it's pointing out as far as possible. But for this one, it's more relaxed. So it's kind of, it's, it's withdrawn a little bit. It's not quite as high, maybe a you know, couple of millimeters difference. It's not quite as high, it's not quite as forward, sticking forward as this, it's relaxed. Uh, and so it's short because it is relaxed. It, this is long because the tongue is tensed, the muscle is tensed. Uh, and this is actually longer than the E in Korean, and this is much shorter than the E of Korean. So this is like bit and beat. So it's not just a short E, it's a different vowel really altogether. Bit, beat, beat, bit. Because the tongue muscle is relaxed. The same is true just um, uh, as um, this sound. I think your, if your dictionaries use that symbol, that's really misleading for the um, sound of like look and the U sound like in Luke. <coughs> uh, same thing. This is kind of uh, with the tongue muscle being high in the back of the mouth. So this occurs in the front of the mouth. And this is kind of happening more in the back of the mouth where the, the tongue muscle back here is kind of really high here. Uh, and it's long like in Luke. But here it's relaxed and it's a little bit shorter. Fortunately, this vowel is not so common in English. Uh, it's not as common. Um, but it is confusing because the letter U in spelling can be this or this, or it can be this uh, another thing. So that's kind of confusing. But um, this does make a difference. Uh, for example, if you're saying, uh, look, I, if you're telling your child, if your child is misbehaving and you say, look, I am your father. In other words, pay attention to me. But if you're Darth Vader, then you can say, Luke, I am your father. So it makes a difference. Look, I am your father. And Luke, I am your father. And you can say this if you're Darth Vader or if you have a child named Luke. <clears throat> so that makes a difference. So these two are problematic because um, Koreans are, you, you've probably never been taught what's happening with your tongue. The fact that these are relaxed, relaxed and tense. And compared to, say, the U in Korean, this is probably longer uh, than the U of Korean. And this is much shorter, like look and look. So there's a difference in the length, but also the vowel sound is completely different. Look, 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 look. Completely different. Um, other problem is, uh, for example, uh, this sound. And your dictionaries might use this symbol. That's wrong. It's misleading uh, compared to this. And for this one, if your dictionaries use something like that, well, that's wrong. That's misleading. Because it really doesn't tell you how it actually it's pronounced. <coughs> the correct linguistic symbol for this is it's a, like an epsilon. And for this one, um, you can use EI or EY, either one. The thing is, these are, well, this is kind of like this sound in Korean, the E. It's kind of like, it's pretty much like that, as far as I can tell. But this one is not, you know, really like that. Uh, this is really a double vowel. It's really two vowels together. It is really an, like an E plus an E, A, A. And for years, you've probably assumed or been taught that this is just a long version of this, and it's not. This is a completely different vowel. This is really a double vowel. It's an E plus an E, and they glide together. A, A. So we don't really have a pure E in English. Um, we, there is a pure E in German and French and Spanish, um, but not in English unless you speak Scottish dialect. In Scottish, in Scotland, you might say, uh, like, where can I take the train? You, know, you might say that in Scotland, but in Scottish English, but not in normal, in, in standard English. This is E, like in red, 
and this is an A. And this is, it's longer, but it's really a blend of two vowels together. And Koreans will sometimes mispronounce this, and it will sound like this, or maybe like this, which will be hard to understand. So you want to practice that A. It's, it's much longer because of that glide. It glides into an E. A. A. You know, so maybe you want to emphasize it or exaggerate it for practice if you're not used to this vowel. If you listen to any English, it's certainly not that. It's uh, this. You can write it like this or this. <coughs> but one that I find even perhaps more problematic and cause more misunderstandings uh, is the difference between the O vowel. And again, your dictionaries might use that, which is really misleading. It's not really necessarily a long vowel, uh, except in certain contexts. But this is uh, like an bot. And the, the long O is really It's a double vowel also. It's a blended vowel. It is not uh, really like this. Um, it, is, it is not just like this. It is really this plus this. It's o plus u, o, o. So this one, I think, is particularly problematic for Koreans because <coughs> uh, Oftentimes, they try to say boat, and it sounds like bot. Like, I have a bot. If you have a bot, that sounds like a robot or something. B-O-T is kind of a sh short for robot. I bought a bot. Oh, you bought a robot? No, I bought a bot. No, it's a boat. Okay. I bought a boat. OK, not a bot, like a robot or an an like an android. <coughs> Well, I guess in Japan you can buy a bot that can clean your home, but uh, otherwise not normally. So um, this is relatively short bot, and this is long because it's a double vowel, blended vowel. O. Oh. You start from here and then add an O to it. O. Oh, o. Oh. Um, now there are some regional variations with this with these two vowels actually. That, kind, that are kind of confusing. In England, inst often instead of O, it's more like a schwa. It's the U uh plus an U, like a, a boat. I bought a boat in English, British English. Uh, more of a O. It's kind of a U, uh, an O, O. I bought a boat. And also some um, dialects in the southeastern US, they do this. Instead of O, it's a bit more like an O, O, a uh, O. Uh, and in many American dialects, um, especially in the South and in the West of the U.S., this disappears and this becomes just an ah, uh, where this, the ah, like in father, is the same as oh. They drop this and this becomes ah. So in, say, the Southern U.S. or in the Western U.S., they would say more like bot, bot, like this, ah, just like the ah in father. Uh, just like this, ah. Uh. Uh, so when you listen to American English, many times American speakers uh, will say this instead of o, uh, and British speakers will say o instead of o. It's a slight difference. <clears throat> Finally, another thing that's problematic for Koreans, we have a, uh, like in hut, and we have this um, sound, we call it schwa. The name of this vowel, the name of this letter comes from Hebrew uh, because this is a common sound in the Hebrew language. Um, this is kind of like the, this in about, these are kind of like this in Korean. Uh, hut, I don't know if you can, can, I guess this would be like this in Korean, I guess kind of like hut. I don't know if this, oh, I, I recently, there's a, some kind of a herb or tree that starts with this. Hut, something. Huh? Hut. Hutke namu. Is that right? Yeah, I recently drank some of that kind of nice energy drink. Uh, 
the juice from the mangoes. Uh, <clears throat> this is really similar, really similar sound, but it's very, very short. So here we have like a distinction between long and short vowels, which is really important because that's an important part of English rhythm, by the way. This comes in later with the rhythm and the stress system. Um, uh, particularly these um, are in, uh, especially common in stressed syllables, syllables that have stress, oftentimes have these long vowels. These tend to be more common in uh, unstressed or less stressed vowels. That's an important part of English rhythm. Uh, this is a short vowel, like hut. This is very, very similar, but it's extra, extra short, about, like the uh and about. And that's important because a lot of the common, uh, very, very common words like uh, the, an uh, well, an, uh, it's basically reduced to this. And it becomes hard for Koreans to hear when an English speaker is saying these because these are so short in English, like the, you just say the, an, an, and it sometimes drops out. Uh, we don't usually say the except for emphasis. We don't usually say a except for emphasis. Supposedly, there's a story many years ago of a Korean student who went to America for the first time, goes into McDonald's, and he asks, he says, give me a hamburger. But we don't usually say a, we say ah, uh, give me a hamburger. It's very quick, give me a hamburger. See, very quick, give me a hamburger. Well, because he said a hamburger, they thought he was saying eight hamburgers, and so the poor guy got eight burgers that he didn't want. I'm told it's a true story. <laughs> it's a very common kind of misunderstanding. It, uh, for a language like Korean, every syllable is the same length. English has this distinctive rhythm. Some syllables are long, some are short, some are extra short. And for Koreans, this is hard to hear. And it takes a lot of practice, perhaps, to train your ears to hear uh, these extra short sounds and to be able to speak uh, with this kind of rhythm where syllables have different lengths, which is really important for the rhythm of English. English has a totally different rhythm than Korean uh, does. So <clears throat> uh, this becomes, for example, an issue in, say, longer words. Here's an example on the sheet, like unforgettable. The un is very short, unforgettable. Uh, the er, very short, unfor for very short, unforgettable. The bull is very short. Unforgettable. You hear the stressed syllables. Unforgettable. Unforgettable is really one stressed syllable. Uh, it's really important for the rhythm. If you don't get the rhythm right, the stress and the length of syllables, um, the syllable length, it can sound like a completely different word. And we'll talk about that um, later on. <coughs> Consonants. Uh, consonants are somewhat tricky also in English. P and F, you know that P and F and the B and V are problems for Koreans. Uh, I remember several, oh, it was about 12 years ago, the first time I was working here. I was an English teacher at Kode. I had an ear problem. I went to the, the uh, hospital. Uh, with my ear problem, and I was being interviewed by, I guess, an intern or a resident, not a real doctor. Uh, and he was asking me about my symptoms. And he said to me, do you have pullness? And I couldn't understand what he meant by pullness, which is not a word. What is pullness? Well, well eventually, with my wife's help, we figured out what he was trying to say. He was trying to say congestion, which is actually the correct word for how your head or your ears feel stuffy. But he had the wrong word, and he was mispronouncing it. He was trying to say fullness, but it sounded like fullness because of the P and F problem. And Koreans are not taught, well, P and the F, you know, it's just the teeth against the lips. That's actually not too hard, but Koreans have not been taught properly how to say those things. P and F distinction, L and R, of course, you know, is problematic for Koreans. 
Um, the difference is actually not that hard, but it takes a lot of training. The basic difference is if this is the top of your mouth, the roof of your mouth, for the L, your tongue tip is touching the top of the mouth. It's touching, it's making contact. For the R, it's not touching, it's just approaching the top of the mouth and it's creating a little friction. Right? The air is kind of just flowing around the tongue and your tongue tip moves some. R, R. That's all it is, it's actually pretty simple. But for second language learners, it's actually not so simple. It takes a lot of practice. And first, Koreans need to be taught correctly how to say R and L. And then, of course, you have to do a good deal of practice because it is kind of hard to train your tongue to do that in a second language when you're older. <coughs> um, the Z, when Koreans say the Z, they tend to make it like the jit, and it's not like a jit at all. Uh, it's completely different. I need some board space. Do you know what the difference is between the, the English Z and the Korean Jit? Hmm? Pardon? Okay, well, you know a bit of linguistics. Uh, the Jit is almost, is kind of close though. There is a, a somewhat of a difference. When you say the palate, we're talking about the top of the mouth. Palatal refers to palate, which is the top part of the mouth, what we call the palate. It's kind of a biological term for it, the top part of the mouth here. Eh. It's, it's bony, uh, kind of hard. <clears throat> well, for jiet compared to z, for jiet or tiet or san tiet, um, Basically, your tongue position is very different than for English. In Korean, your tongue is flat. So this is the top of the mouth. Your tongue is flat, and you're kind of using this part of the tongue, not quite the tip, but kind of the front, um, near the front end of the tip. Uh, and it's kind of touching, um, not exactly the palate like in English, but it's kind of closer to the teeth, between the palate and the teeth. So your tongue is flat for um, G, 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 like G, or also for the C, uh, the C sound, like like C, like time, uh, C, Shigan, the your tongue is flat like this. For English Z, your tongue is not flat. Uh, it's kind of up like this. And actually, the position of your tongue for Z is exactly the same as for S. So if you want to say, uh, if you have trouble with the English Z, start with an S, because it's exactly the same as an S. Your tongue position is just the same as for an S. <clears throat> and then you put some vibration in it. If you put your hand on your throat here and, and start making an S, and then vibrate, you feel that vibration? Okay. That's your Z. That's all you do to make a Z is start with an S and then vibrate it. The vibration is from here in your throat. Actually, the vibration is important. That'll actually uh, be important for a lot of other English sounds in a minute. So uh, <clears throat> you don't need to make your Zs like a G. It's really like an S, but with a vibration here. This vibration from your voice, which <coughs> uh, we call the, the vocal cords or in biology, properly, it's the glottis. And it's basically a flap of tissue here in your throat. You've got your voice box or, or your larynx. And inside here, there's basically a flap of tissue. And it might just rest and not vibrate when you go. Or you can vibrate it because the air sits in a vibration really, really, really fast. Uh, and makes that zzz, makes a vibration like zzz. And it's happening down here, right down here. Um, this, so the tongue position is also relevant in English for other sounds like the sh and the j, and this is voiced sh, j, sh, j, same thing, sh, j, and also the uh, ch and the j. So uh, these are 
what we call voiced, that means the, the vibration. Uh, sorry, these are unvoiced, no vibration. These are voiced. And again, your tongue is like this. For Korean, it or she, your tongue is flat like this. For English, your tongue is kind of curled up. And your, the tip of your tongue uh, is pointing, uh, is either pointing to the palate, like for sh, it's curled up for sh, uh, or it's touching, like for ch. So for, if you compare the sh and this, like she, like shigan, this is different. If you compare um, the English she and she. You hear the difference? She, she, flat tongue and tongue curled up toward the palate. She, she, they're different. They're different, completely different sounds. Uh, but unfortunately, Koreans have not been taught properly, so for Koreans, it's really hard to hear this difference or hard to make this difference. Um, this is sh and zh, voice, sh, zh, ch, j, kind of involving the palate, tongue tip. Touching the palate, cha cha, not hard yeah, if you're just taught properly. <clears throat> so, because Koreans have not been pro pro properly taught, they will say these with a flat tongue, and this will give a very distinctive Konglish accent, like when they say uh, chuchi or something when they're trying to say, or fishy, and this becomes a problem when these sounds are at the end of a word. Uh, for one thing, because in Korean, you don't put sounds like these at the pachim of Korean syllables. But also because for Koreans, if your tongue is flat, it's kind of hard to uh, end a word with a flat tongue when you're saying these. But if your tongue is curled up, then it's easier. So if you're saying these sounds with a flat tongue, and if these sounds are at the end, then the Koreans want to put an extra E at the end, an E sound. So they end up saying fishy. Um, churchy, judgy, uh, beigey, like the color beige, in case you don't know that word, color. Uh, and it's not, if your tongue is actually properly curled up, then you can actually end the syllable, uh, end the word on that sound as a pachim without that extra e, like judge and church, church and Fish. So you don't want to say uh, English, Englishy, because that sounds Konglishy. English, 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 not Englishy, but English, not fishy, but fish. Okay, for the proper nouns. So these are things that give a distinctive Konglish accent. Of course, Koreans also have trouble with a couple of other uh, voiced, voiceless sound pair. This is really confusing. We have two th sounds. In English, we have this one and this one. Uh, this one is voiceless, and this is voiced. <laughs> and these are problematic for Koreans too. It's simply the tongue behind the teeth, the tongue tip behind the front teeth. You don't need to stick out your tongue. Maybe in school they taught you to stick out your tongue. Like, you don't have to stick out your tongue and be rude to people. It's just the tongue tip behind the front teeth, like uh, teeth, and teeth, teeth, and the, the, and that's the voice. So uh, it's simply the tip of the tongue behind the front teeth, behind here. That's all it is. You don't put a lot of energy into it. Because the tongue is stretching really far, you don't put a lot of energy into it. So it's relatively soft sounding. Um, so you don't want to exaggerate by saying, you know, the. It, it shouldn't be overdone. It's, it doesn't have that much energy. Um, and so sometimes you might be confused when you hear these because um, they might be confused with other sounds that have friction. These are friction sounds, involve a lot of friction of the airflow. Uh, S has a lot of friction. The F, uh, F has a lot of friction. But, and so they sound loud. But when you hear these, these have uh, less energy because the tongue muscle is stretching kind of far to, to, to do that, to touch that. So there's not that much energy like teeth, teeth. It's relatively soft sounding 
or you know, the, the. It's, a it's less energy than z, because there's less energy, less acoustic energy, less noise than z or z. And that's one way you can tell them when you're listening. Um, in spelling, unfortunately, these are spelled the same way, which is confusing. Uh, and, well, you can thank the British people for that. They got rid of it. We used to have separate symbols a long time ago in English, and maybe a thousand years ago. For some reason, the British got rid of them, or it was kind of hard to make printing presses with those symbols or something like that. Uh, it's kind of hard. There are some general patterns, though. Uh, this one tends to occur in one minor words, what we call function words. Uh, function words are minor words um, like articles and prepositions and conjunctions and such things. Um, content words are your more important words. Nouns, verbs, adjectives are content words. Um, this sound tends to occur most often in when you see th in function words like the, uh, although, though. Um, Many of, your, many of your prepositions, conjunctions, this, that, these, those, for example, function words. Uh, it also occurs in uh, some old English endings. And I will put up on a, the website later on a handout about th spelling patterns. But it tends to occur in certain old English endings. For example, uh, mother, the er in mother. Uh, bath, you take bath, which is this one. And you add an E, bathe. And the vowel also becomes longer, bathe, the verb. So sometimes they made uh, nouns um, in Eng old, or verbs in Old English this way. So bathe, uh, so this is an Old English ending. Uh, northern, so north, but northern. Uh, this is an Old English ending. Um, <coughs> uh, let me see. Farthest, like that. So certain Old English spelling patterns, when they added um, words at the end, er, est, e, uh, and such. And I'll provide a separate handout on the website later about th spelling patterns. Um, this tends to, to occur in, fun in content words, especially in words from Greek. And most academic words in English with th come from Greek originally. So if it's a word that you don't know, um, particularly an academic word, it's probably this. Because most academic words come from Greek, uh, if they have th, that is. Well, most academic words come from Latin, but if they come from th, they probably came from Greek. And if they're from Greek, it's probably this, because this is the Greek uh, pronunciation. Uh, I know of maybe one exception which is, because it's not from Greek, one exception is the word algorithm. Oops. Uh, well, also rhythm. Uh, in the case of rhythm, the M is voiced, mm, and so the TH becomes voiced, and it happens here too. This is from Greek, but this is from, uh, but this is an exception because the M is making that voiced, and this, do you know what language algorithm comes from? I would be surprised if you know. It came from Persian. The Persian language, or Farsi, Old Persian. And it got kind of Latinized, or Greekified, and then Anglicized, or English, made English-like. But that's not actually Greek, although it looks like it. <coughs> so those are the big problems with, some of the big problems with consonants. Um, I've got a list of some of the uh, uh, voice and voiceless consonants on here. Uh, also, Koreans tend to insert extra vowels. So that sports, sports is one syllable, but in Korean it becomes what, sports, three syllables. Uh, but if you're speaking English, you want to say it as one syllable. We have these consonant clusters, consonants together. So sports is one syllable. So these consonant clusters, clusters tend to be hard for Koreans and Japanese and Chinese. <clears throat> One time I was uh, listening to a medical talk 
And in this talk, the speaker was talking about somatoform disorder. Somatoform is a medical term. But this is kind of an older Korean guy. And he's probably a famous doctor here, so I want to be careful. But whenever he said somatoform, it sounded like the Korean pronunciation of smartphone. Smartphone, smartphone. He was saying smartphone. It sounded like smart. Pon, the Korean smartphone. It sounded just so. It sounded like smartphone disorder. Like, oh, the patient is upset because his iPhone is not working, or something. Uh, so there's a problem with inserting extra vowels uh, when we have consonant clusters. Koreans and Japanese tend to do that. And then if you make every syllable the same length, if you don't pronounce stress correctly, it will also sound. Bad or weird. <clears throat> um, a couple of other things here in the middle of page two: some um, North American aspects. Um, the L in American English sometimes um, is kind of unclear because the jaw is kind of raised up, and so instead of saying uh, "bull," it's more like "bull." Instead of "ball," it's more like "ball." Ball. Uh, Bell becomes bell sometimes. It really depends on where you are in the US and the, and the speakers. It tends to be this dark L where the, the mouth is more closed and the L is harder to hear. It tends to be more common after vowels like a, ah, o, oh, u, or maybe at the end of a word. Uh, but also depends. It's a lot more common in, say, the southern US also. So this is one reason why southern US speakers may be harder to hear when they say L. Um, when you have like a, a T before an unstressed syllable in North American, it sounds kind of like a D, like a little bit of bitter butter. Okay. A little bit of bitter butter. Whereas British would say a little bit of bitter butter. Americans would say a little bit of bitter butter. It's a great tongue twister. Betty bought her but some butter, but the butter was bitter. If I put it in my batter, it would make my batter bitter. So she bought some better butter that wasn't bitter, and her batter wasn't bitter. Uh, you can search for tongue twisters. They're really great for practice. Um, likewise, T before N in an unstressed syllable like, you know, button, like a, a shirt button becomes button in, especially in, in American English and a lot of other types of English, button becomes button. It's kind of either released through the nose or um, kind of swallowed or becomes kind of like an N. And in some British dialects, it happens to the T before L. Uh, so in some British dialects, bottle becomes bottle, bottle, a bottle of Guinness. Oh, one tea, sorry. <clears throat> anyway, um, like I said, stress and rhythm are really, really important. Uh, one time I was asking a friend, a Korean friend, who is going to lead the meeting who is going to lead the meeting tomorrow. And she was trying to say Willie, which is the guy's name, which has a clear stress on the first syllable. First syllable stressed. Second syllable is less stressed. It's got a long vowel, but it's still less stressed. Uh, uh, but she was putting equal stress on both syllables, so it sounded like either Will Lee, and I know no such person, or he, she was saying, will lead. And it sounded like she was echoing. This is actually what I was hearing. And it sounded like she was echoing my question uh, back to me, will lead. Uh, and she was trying to say, will he? Uh, but it sounded like, will lead or will lead. So stress is really important. And there are probably many, many instances I've heard where Mispronouncing the stress causes confusion, and it makes it sound like a different word, even if the, syllable, uh, the vowels and consonants are correct. <clears throat> so Koreans make the mistake of either of uh, mispronouncing stress by making every syllable the same length, or sometimes they overcompensate and they swallow some syllables, especially at the end of a word, um, or they say it in a monotone. And the monotone is really bad because it puts people to sleep. So English has a much stronger intonation than uh, English has much more intonation, much stronger intonation than Korean. And this is really important. Uh, so how do you pronounce stress? 
How do you actually make stress? Stress syllables, what happens? What, how do you produce stress? Okay, so there's a, one thing is intonation. Your intonation tends to go up and down. Maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down, but often it goes up and down on a stressed syllable. So when I say stressed syllable, or like syllable, right, it's kind of going up and down. Syllable. Syllable is going up and down. So your intonation tends to go up and down. Uh, or if it's at the end of a sentence, maybe it just go, kind of goes down a lot more than usual. Or in a question, it goes up a lot more than usual. So one thing is an intonation uh, change. Your pitch uh, varies a lot. And you might want to practice just by exaggerating the intonation. But there are two other things that happen with stress syllables. How else do you produce stress? When I say syllable, syllable, the first one is stressed, syllable. What else do we hear? There's an intonation, rise and fall. What else? The vowel, the vowel is longer. So the vowel is longer, it gets stretched out. So in a word like syllable, this vowel is longer, and it often sounds louder. So you've got the most important thing is the pitch. The intonation goes up and down. The second most important thing is it's longer, syllable. And the third is it tends to sound louder, either actual volume or it sounds louder because of the intonation going up and down. Uh, so this, is, this one is much longer than these. These are very short. Syllable, syllable, syllable. But sometimes when you, um, uh, when you look at, say, a dictionary, actually, it doesn't say that it uh, doesn't make it long, very short. So uh, it is confusing as a teacher sometimes when you talk to teach students. Oh, well, students ask us, actually, oh, no, you know, long is a symbol here. So do we have to make it a bit longer? Yes. Yeah, so for one thing, like I mentioned before with the vowels, uh, if you're using a dictionary that's made in Korea, the vowel symbols might sometimes be incorrect. Uh, and secondly, <clears throat> we have long and short vowels, but then the stress will make uh, vowels longer. Uh, so you could have a short vowel that's in a stress syllable, so it's going to become a little longer. Uh, <coughs> like here. Well, this is a short vowel here. This is the i syllable. So this is going to be longer than the... Um, than this in a, if it's an unstressed, which is an example of this is an unstressed, uh, like here, algorithm, algorithm. This is, this is going to be longer than an algorithm, because this is a main stress, so syllable, and these are very short. Uh, so sometimes the dictionaries may not have enough information for you. Uh, if it's a long vowel, like, uh, what's, what's one with a good long vowel here? Uh, Oh, here we go. The long vowel is going to become even longer in the stress syllable. Um, short vowels, which are phonologically short, get a bit longer under stress. Um, short vowels become shorter uh, and such. So the length of vowels in English gets really complicated because you've got vowels that are naturally long and short, then the stress will also make them longer or shorter longer if they're stressed, shorter if they're unstressed. And to make things more confusing, we have different levels of stress. So, uh, accentuate. Where's the main stress here? Right here. But you've got a minor stress here, secondary level stress, accentuate here. Uh, how about this? There's the main stress, but what about this one? Is this stressed? How do you say that? Is it a or a? This one? It depends. It could be a verb to appropriate, which is a, sorry, it's a secondary stress, which is kind of this sound. Appropriate, 
that's a verb, like to either take something or to um, designate funds for something in kind of a government context. Or it could be unstressed, which is the adjective, appropriate, like that's not appropriate behavior. So this is a common ma mistake for Koreans, words ending in A-T-E. If it's an adjective, it's short, like uh, appropriate. If it's a verb, it's appropriate. It's different. So there are different levels of stress. We've got a main stress, and this could be a minor stress, main stress, minor stress. So uh, for example, on, on page three, uh, within word stresses, you've got primary stress, secondary stress, and you've got unstressed. Um, <clears throat> Then to make things more complicated, we have word stress. So here we're talking about word stress, but then we have compound stress, compound words. So a lot of compound words, well, compound word, compound stress. So compound has more stress than stress. Uh, so for example, here, backbone. So the first part has more stress, backbone. Uh, field mouse, uh, White House. So a lot of compounds have the main stress in the first part. For example, I, um, I grew up in a white house. When I was young, I grew up in a white house. But I will never live in the white house. White house is a compound now. Uh, main stress on the white in the white house. Same with, say, um, maybe you live in a green house. I hope you don't live in a green house, because that would be weird. Uh, you might live in a blue house, probably you don't live in the blue house. Uh, <clears throat> you're not that lucky. Uh, so a lot of stress, a lot of compound words have the main stress in the first part. Um, exceptions being uh, personal names like uh, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, <clears throat> uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, names have the family name stressed. So family name, if it's first, like Ban Ki-moon, the family name is stressed, Ban Ki-moon. Uh, abbreviations have the main stress on the last part, usually FBI, DEA, ROK, uh, UK, and such. Then um, there's the phrasal stress, like a white house. Um, nouns have more stress than adjectives. Then we have sentence stress. And sentence stress is important for kind of indicating what's important, usually um, a content word, usually at or near the end, or a word that we want to emphasize. Every clause, every sentence usually has one content word that's more important than the other. <coughs> uh, and that's important for actually conveying the meaning and the flow of thought. Um, so if you listen to uh, good speakers, good speakers probably have good, clear sentence stress. They emphasize maybe one key word in every sentence or every phrase or every clause, and that helps you to follow their flow of thought. If you don't say sentence stress, it's a little harder to follow their flow of thought. It sounds a bit more monotonal or less interesting. I'll read an example in a minute. But uh, at the bottom of page three, here's an example of intonation. Uh, they're actually two ways of breaking this up. This is a letter without any punctuation. And you can break these phrases up in different ways. Uh, and just by speaking it, the intonation is going to convey the punctuation, which is going to really affect the meaning. Uh, and the stress is going to map onto the intonation. The intonation and the stress kind of uh, go together. They map onto each other. So. There are two ways of reading this letter at the bottom of page three. So usually students, if I give this to them, they'll guess the first way. The first way sounds like this. Dear John, I want a man who knows what love is all about. You are generous, kind, thoughtful. People who are not like you admit to being useless and inferior. So uh, notice the intonation. My intonation goes down at the end of sentences and clauses, which I'll mention. You have ruined me. I'm sorry. You have ruined me for other men. I yearn for you. I have no feelings whatsoever when we're apart. 
I can be happy forever. Will you let me be, will you let me be yours? Gloria. So that's one way of reading it. There is another way of reading this, the different intonation. So pay attention to my intonation, by the way, because if you listen to me, I'm putting a clear stress on each clause. Each clause or each sentence gets one clear stress. One word, usually toward the end of the sentence or clause, gets I mean, uh, more stress than the other content words. And then at the end, my intonation goes down. So the other way of reading this letter is this. Dear John, I want a man who knows what love is. All about you are generous, kind, thoughtful people who are not like you. Admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me. For other men, I yearn. For you, I have no feelings whatsoever. When we're apart, I can be happy forever. Will you let me be? Yours, Gloria. <clears throat> so when I read this, um, you will probably notice that my intonation goes down at the end of sentences. That's because the lungs are running out of air as you get to the end of a sentence. So in, this is natural in all languages. Toward the end of a sentence or a clause, your lungs are running out of air. That causes less pressure here uh, under the vocal cords, and so your intonation goes down. <clears throat> what Korean does is this. In Korean, you have verbs at the end, and so your verb endings kind of fall into this area where your intonation is going down, like blah, 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 hanida. So in the hanida, the verb endings, your intonation is going down. Because that's less important, like of tochak uh, hanida. So the tochak is kind of the important information, where your intonation is kind of normal. And at the end of the sentence, tochak hanida, your intonation is going down on verb endings or other endings in Korean. In English, we use this, this final lowering of the intonation in a different way. Uh, <clears throat> in a sentence like, uh, I have no feelings whatso whatsoever. Uh, there's maybe a sentence stress on whatsoever, and the intonation is going down. <clears throat> uh, or, I want, an, I want a man who knows what love is all about. So the intonation is kind of going down on about. I'm maybe putting some stress on that. Uh, and then the intonation is going down. I want a man who knows what love is all about. Uh, you're kind, generous, thoughtful. Let's see. Uh, you have ruined me for, here we go. You have ruined me for other men. If I say you've ruined me for other men, I'm maybe putting emphasis on ruined. You have ruined me for other men. So the other men is kind of less important information. There I'm letting the intonation go down. You have ruined me. So sentence stress on ruined. You have ruined me for other men. So intonation goes down. So for other men, that's kind of less important information. The intonation goes down there, kind of like the Hanida in Korean, because I'm putting the main stress on ruined. On page four, you can go online and listen to this example. <coughs> uh, you can find many examples of good speakers on, say, TED.com. This is an excerpt from one such speech. Uh, here's a speaker talking about education. Uh, hopefully, I got most of these stresses right. I've highlighted or bold-faced the stresses. Some cases I wasn't sure because he seems to be emphasizing two words together sometimes. You listen to them. Um, footnote is at the bottom uh, with the information. This particular speaker, he's British, speaks very clearly, very good speech. He, he says, now our education system is predicated on the idea of academic ability. So he's putting special emphasis on predicated. And academic ability is what he's been talking about already, so it's not so important in terms of the information flow. And there is a reason. The whole system was invented. Around the world, there was no public systems of education really before the 19th century. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. <clears throat> so the hierarchy is rooted in two ideas. Number one, the most uh, useful subjects for work are at the top. So you're probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, things you liked, on the grounds that you would never get a job doing that, using emphasis. <clears throat> Is that right? Don't do music. You're not going to be a musician. Don't do art. You won't be an artist. Benign advice, now profoundly mistaken. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. And the second is academic ability, which has really come to dominate our view of intelligence because the university has designed the system in their image. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many Highly talented, brilliant, creative people think that they're not. 
because the thing that they were good at at school wasn't valued or is actually stigmatized. And I think we can't afford to go on that way. So you notice how he's using uh, the, the sentence stress to highlight maybe a, an important content word, usually near the end of a sentence uh, in the predicate, or sometimes words for special emphasis. Because he's making a lot of emphatic points in his speech about education. And he's really contradicting a lot of common assumptions about education in this speech. <clears throat> so he's using sentence stress for that way. So if you listen to this guy and other good speakers on, say, TED.com, you'll see them using sentence stress. Um, there's some other things here on page four. Some of these you don't have to do if you're speaking. In fact, if you're speaking to Korean students, if you're teaching Korean students, they may not know these things, so maybe you don't want to use these and, uh, and confuse your students if they don't know about these things in English. But you will hear these a lot when you listen to English by native English speakers. Um, 3.6, we do a lot of linking between words. If one word ends in a consonant and the next word begins with a similar consonant, we kind of link them together. Like, we all live in a yellow submarine. Uh, so we all, two vowels, you can easily link two vowels together. You just not, there's not a break. Not we all, if you just say we all live in a yellow submarine, it sounds like a robot. <clears throat> we link words together when possible. It's easier to say, it's smoother. Um, so notice the L's, like all live. And if a word begins with a vowel, we might link the consonant before it at the end of a word, a patsim consonant before it, uh, with uh, the next word that begins with a vowel, like live in, live in, live in. So we all live in a yellow submarine. It's not a terribly academic example, but <clears throat> it gives you the idea. We do this a lot, especially in spoken English, especially in informal English. It's very common, and this is one reason that Koreans, uh, Japanese, tend to have trouble listening to English and comprehending English from a native speaker, especially English media, especially popular media, uh, pop songs and such, because there's a lot of linking that's going on. And when we hear English, we expect linking. In fact, a cute example, <coughs> there is a famous rock song in the 1970s by a man named Jimi Hendrix where he sings, Let Me Kiss the Sky. But because he was, he was kind of one of the pioneers of rock music who, uh, for one thing, pioneered the technique of shouting instead of singing in hard rock, who was probably one of the first real hard rock musicians. He's kind of shouting this, Let Me Kiss the Sky, but people he, he wasn't linking, but people heard this as linking. And it, they thought he was saying, let me kiss this guy, which was a little scandalous in the 1970s. Let me, why is he saying, let me kiss this guy? That sounds kind of perverted. <clears throat> uh, we expect linking, actually. Uh, uh, next, there's some common reductions of words, like a is a, an is an, and such because is cause, you may know some of these. <coughs> um, notice that can is often can, like I can do it, but I can't do it, that can't does not reduce, so it's always an a, ah, I can't do it. So that's how you distinguish can and can't. The, the, the can is often reduced to it, can, I can do it. It's very quick, often reduces to that schwa, I can do it, but I can't do it. It's still clear, we don't reduce the can't. Uh, these also kind of lead to something else, which I didn't put in here. There's a common phenomenon in pronunciation called blending. And we, that's where sounds merge together, blend together. A, a common example in Korean might be this. So it's spelled Wang Sheep Li, but you say Wang Shim Ni. So these blend together, and that's common in Korean. Now we have these kinds of blendings in English too, but different kinds of blendings. Uh, for example, mainly with uh, function words. It's mainly with function words, or a function word with a content word, where can't you becomes can't you. And then this often is reduced to a uh or an uh, so can't you. 
So it's often with, say, D or T uh, or an S, like as your, uh, as, your, as your president, I promise I will do this and this, as your, as your. So this mainly happens in English uh, with function words, with most often the T or the D or the S, uh, these kinds of sounds that are kind of in that area of the mouth, especially. We don't do, um, so there are different kinds of blendings that you do in Korean, and you have to be careful not to do Korean blendings in English. So for example, another one in Korean might be, uh, was it, how do you pronounce that, quali? Is that right, you say quali? So you're blending the, the N and the L. But not in English. So I will sometimes hear Koreans mispronounce download. And they'll say something like, they'll blend the N and the L, and then it becomes hard to hear, like download or down, download. Uh, I hear sometimes Koreans say that. So that's a blending that's not legal, not possible in English. Uh, so you have to be careful not to do Korean blendings in English. You don't have to necessarily do these blendings, uh, uh, if you're speaking to Koreans especially, but be careful not to do these Korean blendings, like with biup and liel and nian. Uh, these don't work in English. These Korean blendings don't work. They will lead to confusion. I think on the other hand out on the website, I'll have a list of some of these Korean blendings which are not allowable in English. <coughs> So these are some of the key points with vowels, consonants, and stress. Um, so one problem is you've probably never been taught this stuff before if you learned English here in Korea. Secondly, learning a second language as an adult is hard, and pronunciation is one of the hardest things to overcome in a second language. There's really not much you can do but to do a lot of practice, but practice is kind of boring in a second language. Um, so <clears throat> just a few suggestions for your vocal delivery if you're teaching or giving a presentation in English. I guess one thing is just to uh, play with the different sounds of English, try to figure out where they are made in the mouth, uh, or there's some, you can easily go to Wikipedia and find out uh, kind of a linguistic description of, say, the sounds of English. But it helps to know, at least for the problematic ones, where they are made in the mouth. Maybe play with your vocal organs, your, your lips, your teeth, your tongue, and just understand where these sounds are made, like the ones I've pointed out that are problems for Koreans. P and F, L, R, the J and the Ch and the Fishi and the Kongushi and such. <clears throat> understand where they are made in the mouth, roughly how they're made. Uh, and then you can kind of occasionally kind of exaggerate these for practice, like uh, for yourself, like you know, rock and lock. You can kind of exaggerate. If you have trouble with these sounds, maybe practice by exaggerating, like lock and rock, you know. Uh, and likewise, with practicing stress, if you're giving a presentation or a lecture, maybe the key academic words in your lecture, maybe beforehand you want to practice, maybe. Uh, over articulate, hyper articulate for practice, like accentuate, maybe uh, for practice, kind of over exaggerate the stress patterns, the rhythm, the length, it accentuate uh, so that you can actually focus in pronouncing them. Because when you're giving a lecture or a presentation, you don't want to think too much about the pronunciation. You want to practice, you want to focus on the content of what you're talking about. You don't want to be distracted while you're giving a talk, you don't want to be distracted by questions of pronunciation. Am I saying it correctly? Or is my grammar correct? Or is my word choice correct? You want to practice that before you give a presentation or a lecture because you cannot really multitask during a presentation. You can't worry about uh, is your English correct and focus on the contents, the contents you're trying to teach or convey to somebody, or the point you're trying to make to an audience. You can't focus on language and content very easily at the same time. So you want to make sure you practice beforehand, maybe practice by exaggerating your pronunciation, exaggerate the stress, uh, over-articulate the length of vowels, the stress, the intonation, unstressed syllables, 
the vowel qualities, <coughs> the consonants. Um, you can um, find good videos online to practice with. You probably know TED.com, for example. Uh, for many TED.com videos, does everybody know TED.com? Does anybody not know TED.com? It's one of the most popular sites for public for speeches on the, the internet. In case you don't know TED.com, there are many uh, excellent speakers there, excellent speakers from government, education, NGOs, business, etc. People who are very good public speakers. Uh, many of the speeches have transcriptions. There's usually a button where you can get an English transcription, uh, and many of them you can download. Some of them you can download with subtitles. And if you download videos from TED.com or from other sites, from YouTube, um, <clears throat> I think in Korea you like to use GOM Player. It's very popular in Korea. But in other countries, VLC Player, you can find this is free. The VLC Player is a free program. It has a better interface than GOM. It can handle some uh, video types that GOM can't handle. Uh, and it's easy, particularly easy in VLC to slow down the playback speed. So you can download videos and in VLC player at the bottom there's a little button you can drag and slow down the playback speed. So you can slow down the playback speed and listen to subtitles. And sometimes you can do shadowing which is just repeating after the speaker. Now, you can't do this a whole lot, you know, you can start to get bored and then stop. You don't want to push yourself and, uh, when you're bored because it's kind of not good for your motivation. But uh, to a certain degree, you know, listen to a lot of videos, sometimes practice by shadowing, by imitating after the speaker. Slow them down on VLC player if you have to. <clears throat> so those are ways you can practice your, your speaking and your pronunciation by imitating after good speakers. Uh, like those on uh, various websites that you like. Or if you like pop songs, do pop songs. Do different kinds of media, stuff that you like, stuff you enjoy, stuff that you find interesting or informative. Don't do stuff that you find boring, like a lot of textbook stuff, because typical listening textbooks or English textbooks, they're boring. You can't learn if it's boring or if it's not, if you don't enjoy it, you can't be motivated. Motivation is really, really important for learning a language and for being able to remember things. Motivation, if you're really interested in something, if you really enjoy the material, that's really important for being able to actually learn. If you're bored with something, if you're not motivated um, by a particular material, you can't really remember it very well. It actually affects your ability to remember uh, from what you're learning. Motivation really affects your memory, your long-term memory, your ability to learn and remember from something. So it's important to find stuff that you like, stuff that's interesting or fun, um, stuff that's relevant to what you're studying, as well as stuff that's just fun. Uh, so whether it's Jimi Hendrix songs uh, <clears throat> or uh, your favorite professor on TED.com or whatever, uh, find different kinds of listening materials for practice. Uh, finally. Intonation of English. English has a lot more intonation, has a lot more stress. So as they say, English is a stressful language, right? This requires use of your diaphragm. So I might have mentioned this during my first talk, the first seminar, or one of the previous ones, and I will probably mention it again in case people weren't here before. <clears throat> the diaphragm is this muscle here right below your lungs. It's really important for speaking, for pu public speaking. Uh, a lot of teachers make the mistake of using their throat muscles and then their voice gets sore pretty quickly. Uh, you also need a lot of energy, especially for doing it in a second language, especially for a language like English that requires a lot of intonation. My voice is going sore because of allergy problems and cold and such too, but <clears throat> uh, the diaphragm muscle is what you need to rely on to give you that energy uh, for the intonation and for speaking and projecting your voice. Um, it also helps if you just imagine that you're projecting your voice to the back of the room and also if you suck in your stomach muscles. So when I'm talking to an audience, I try to actually suck in my stomach muscles. So if I suck in my stomach, I'm pushing the diaphragm up. The diaphragm is pushing 
then my lungs in, and it's the diaphragm that's actually uh, giving the force and the energy for my voice so that I can talk loud enough. <clears throat> because if you don't use your diaphragm, uh, you're going to get tired very quickly during your lecture. Uh, and your voice is going to get sore, like my, mine is doing right now. Uh, although I am using my diaphragm. If I weren't using my diaphragm, I would not be able to talk right now. <clears throat> uh, I may talk about this again, but there are diaphragm exercises that you can do. You can practice, of course, just uh, when you're speaking, suck in your stomach. When you're not speaking sometimes, when you're going through the day, try to just tense and suck in your stomach uh, as a diaphragm muscle exercise to develop the diaphragm muscles. <clears throat> there are some diaphragm exercises you can do. If you have any friends who are singers, they can probably teach you voice exercises and diaphragm exercises. Um, some of them look kind of silly, but basically just breathing in deeply and then exhaling very slowly as an exercise, maybe in the morning or before you lecture, like you go. So I'm exhaling very slowly. Or you exhale and vocalize a vowel like, uh, and so on. I won't do the whole thing, but probably do that when nobody is around, maybe at home by yourself. <laughs> Otherwise, people will think you're a little strange. <clears throat> Your family members might wonder if something's wrong with you, if the pressures of school have finally caused you to crack mentally. Um, also, jogging. Uh, jogging is really good. Uh, for, develop, for uh, developing your diaphragm, your lungs, your ability to breathe well. <clears throat> and also for energy when you're speaking. Water is the best thing to drink when you're speaking. Lukewarm water, not too hot, not too cold. Water uh, or other things without sugar. <clears throat> Don't rely on... Well, actually, it's actually not good to drink coffee while you're talking because coffee or other kinds of caffeine will make the vocal cords dry or feel dry will make your... Throat, your throat still dry. <clears throat> so water is the best thing while lecturing. If I drink coffee, I drink coffee probably several hours before I lecture. Actually, I had a coffee right after lunch, which probably was not a good idea today. <laughs> coffee is not really good for, for speaking. Um, also avoid stuff with a lot of sugar before you lecture. Um, a lot of sugar in your body or carbohydrates is really not good for your energy levels. You get, if you have something starchy, like um, um, pastry breads, like donuts or you know bakery breads, that kind of stuff, just white bread, uh, sugary stuff, um, sodas, candies, even fruit juices, which have often added sugar, you get a temporary energy spike for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then after that, your energy drops off. Uh, and you get more tired because the body is removing that sugar or carbohydrates from the blood and storing it away. And so after 15 or 20 minutes, the body has pulled that stuff out of your bloodstream and you get more tired. And you need energy levels um, for lecturing, especially for using intonation in English and just speaking in a second language. <clears throat> Maybe you've noticed that uh, Perhaps if you talk in English um, for, say, half an hour, is it more tiring than talking in Korean for half an hour for you? Maybe yes or no. Or listening to a lecture. Is listening to an English lecture more tiring mentally than a Korean lecture? Probably. Because if you're doing something in a second language, you're having to use your brain more. Uh, in a second language, the second language is not very automatic. You have to use a lot more of your working memory, uh, whether it's reading or listening or um, talking or writing. Uh, doing something in a second language, it's not very automatic. You have to use more of your working memory. The brain burns a lot of sugar um, to do this, and so you feel more tired, probably in, when you're doing something in a second language. So keep that in mind too. So you need to perhaps exercise more for your energy levels and eat more healthy if you're going to be teaching in English. Um, yes? Can I have a question? Because uh, when I heard you was, I mean, to make a presentation here, so I can uh, hear a uh, lot of uh, resonance from uh, you know, your sounds. But sometimes in Korean people lack 
uh, legends when you talk in English, you saw that uh, there are many differences between native speakers and Korean people. Mm -hmm. So how can you... Um, I guess if you're talking about resonance, it's maybe because I'm using my diaphragm when I talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've been kind of doing this for some time, um, talking and tensing, pulling in my stomach muscles and using my diaphragm to make my voice more clear. Uh, and this is something I had to learn because about two years ago I got really sick for a long time. I had bronchitis, uh, which is ki guan ji yum, um, and I had that for about four months and I was having to work while sick. Uh, and so because my voice was so weak, I had to go and find information on how to talk, how to use my voice, how to overcome a weak voice. And I had to really learn and practice a lot how to use my diaphragm while talking. So this is something I've had to do as a teacher. Um, this is something you can do on your own. You can uh, find some, you can practice yourself. You can maybe find some few videos on the internet, on YouTube to help you to practice, to use your diaphragm, um, imitate good speakers, do exercise. Uh, have some, if you have friends who are music, who are singers, they can probably show you some voice exercises and diaphragm exercises also. Because I've, I've had to learn that on my own, uh, to use the diaphragm, that's what I'm doing. Other questions? All right, then uh, hopefully we'll see you, um, I guess, next week and have a good Chuseok.